Crispin Sarwell, good to see you, my friend. Good to see you, Dan. Um, welcome to everyone out there in Sophia land, meaningoflife.tv, bloggingheads.tv. This is the Sophia program. I am your host, Daniel Kaufman. I'm a professor of philosophy at Missouri State University. I also publish an online magazine called The Electric Agora. I am here with fan favorite and personal favorite, Crispin Sartwell, uh, associate professor of philosophy at Dickinson College. Um, we, uh, we are both still uncertain about what our falls are really going to look like, especially with this at least somewhat new wave of COVID in some cases. It's hitting places that haven't really been hit very hard yet. Other places that's coming back, like California is getting around too. Um, right now, as far as you know, you guys are going back in class, masked, I take it. Yeah. But do you have the facilities to put smaller groups into larger rooms, or is that very limited? Like, we have lecture halls. They could take a class of 30 and put in a class for 90. Right. And we people have- can sit. I mean, is that something that you can even do, or – no, we're, I mean, we only have a couple rooms that are big enough to socially distance with a class of 35, which is about as big as we get. So um, are they going to even bother socially distancing in classes, or are they simply going to hope that masks do the trick? They're going to, I think they're going to go for hybrid distance and live. And then they're also, uh, they might split some of these up into two sections. Split uh, sections and have them alternate slots? So you teach more slots to fewer people? Yeah, and the faculty is pretty... I could see that working if the faculty aren't going to be dicks. Yes. And bitch and moan about the additional man hours. Yeah. Which I have no... I don't know how you feel about that. I have no patience for that sort of thing. We have a cushy job. (laughs) We do. We're not digging holes in the street. You know what I mean? I I just don't... I hope they do do something like that because it actually would make it much safer and would put the students' parents at mind at ease and yeah. piling them all up in a room. I don't know if the, if the masks are enough, right? You know what I mean? It's Yeah. No, I agree. And I'm not sure how it's going to come out, really. Just What are they doing about residence life? You said you have a residence life problem. Yeah. I think they're basically putting – they're going to go with plan A, put everyone back in their rooms. Uh, Even those that are shares. Yeah. See, I think Indiana is putting everyone in a single. I don't think we can do that. You know how they're doing it? They've basically taken over several hotels that are on campus, which you can't do. I mean, you don't have that kind of infrastructure. (laughs) Um, um, Yeah, two hotels in Bloomington now, you cannot rent rooms because basically the university is using them so it can spread out their dorm population. Mm -hmm. Um, But I still, you know, we talked before. The real problem is that no matter what you do, you to expect that 20 year olds are going to comply with social distancing and masking in social environments strikes me as unrealistic and somewhat of a dereliction of duty on the part of us as adults. Um, sort of like, okay, we should know they're not going to do this. And so we have to make plans that take into account that they're not going to do this, right? So you think it should be distance this year? Or I have I have a much more radical views as I've told you. I think we should bring back mandatory retirement. I think they should send home everybody over seventy, and they should just let the kids get on with it. Um, that's my view, but yeah. uh, that's not obviously going to happen. So that's not even a view I would debate um, because I would only want to debate something that's plausible that could actually happen. But ethically, that's at this point what I think should be done. I, I feel at this point that what we're doing to young people is not fair, um, and. Um, I don't know that I think it's fair to tell a 20 year old you have to abort your, your social life and maybe not, you know, meet people. My, my daughter is still yet to date anyone. Also that someone who's 80 can go to his office. I I just don't know because that's the main problem on campus, right? Is that the the risk to aged, aged faculty. And of course the secondary risk to kids bringing home shit to their grandparents and stuff like that. But that's, in a sense, their family's responsibility to manage. That's not the university's responsibility to manage, right? Uh, well, I mean, it's probably better if the university doesn't create a situation where that happens a lot. Or something well, like what that. we're doing is we're ending at Thanksgiving so that people don't yeah. go and come back. I don't know if you guys are doing the same. Yes. 
Yes. All right. Well, Corona marches on, and so what we should do is talk about metaphysics. Um, (laughs) All right. So we've been doing this series on these prolegomena that I've written, and you've been very helpful. And actually now it's become a nice sort of almost synthesis where what I write next depends in part on what we talked about and some of the points that you stressed. So I'm going to – there's been – Huh? That makes me happy. There's yeah. um yeah, I'm getting to the point where I think probably I I'm gonna either have to co author it, say it's co authored, or I'm gonna have to sort of just have like a giant footnote in neon that says half of this is because of Christian Sartwell. Um, <laughs> so when all the big bucks come in, you'll at least get royalties. Um um but yeah, no, so I'm gonna, like, there's been two installments now since our last one. And so I'm going to let you choose what to talk about. One installment was, was on basically the question of explanatory unity. Um, and the second installment, the most recent one has been on um, more generally what philosophy is about, what it does, how we should think about inquiry more general in light of a lot of the things I've been talking about. And it seems, seemed like in our private conversation, you wanted, you were more interested in talking about that. So I'm just going to sort of let you, lead in terms of bring up the topics you want to ask questions about, push on, maybe offer an alternative. So where did you want to start? Okay. Well, I mean, just talking about the explanatory unity uh, stuff, I just want to say like, you made me think about that somewhat differently. Um, And when I read your entry, I found myself, even though the entry itself, I think says that, you know, Crispin Sartwell is, incredibly committed to explanatory unity. And I might have said stuff like that. That was may have been a misimpression, but I thought you felt strongly about it at the end of the I, last conversation. I, you almost I, said, I think you said, I, re, I want there to be one account. I think you said of the, of the world, so to speak. I, I want there to be one world. And I, I, but I think that, you know, this idea that there is just one ultimate account in some sense, and it's physics perhaps, uh, you know, I, that's not something I ever, would ever have wanted to embrace. So you never accepted the sort of the positivistic unity of the sciences thesis. I don't think I did. I don't think I had thought about it enough, really. I just, I reread the Fodor paper, uh, for the first time in decades, really. Uh, and I found myself agreeing basically with that as well. So you uh, weren't, you weren't, when you were trained in the analytic tradition, you weren't made to read like Ernest Nagel's structure of science where he goes through all the inter-theoretic yeah. reductions and you get that whole idea that, you know, physics is sort of general science and then everything else is a sort of a instantiation of physics and all that. Did you not get put through that machine? Oh yes. And I mean, I took a course like that with Peter Ashenstein. Um, and even then, I mean, he had definitely taken the turn off of people like Nagel or whatever, you know, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't that kind of unity of science or reductionist type of person at all. Um, and so I guess I'd sort of viewed it as something that was sort of over and I kind of dismissed it in a way. Like I stopped worrying about whether aesthetics could be reduced to physics. Yeah. So the Um, point is that when you said you want an explanatory unity, I, what I was thinking of is not what you were thinking of. Yeah. I mean, I'd be satisfied with the idea that there is just one world, as you say, uh, and that, you know, all these different approaches to this insanely rich reality uh, are compatible in some broad sense, or at least not, not contradictory. Like it's a single system in that sense. And that means, so it can, um, if there's one world, it can't be the case that whatever my account of laws and regulations are is going to conflict with what my account of, of fundamental particles yes. are, right? right? But it doesn't require a stronger, something stronger than that sort of consistency, right? It doesn't require that there be a count into which both fit in some sort of mutually supporting, coherent Right. That, that's what strikes me as a bridge too far. I don't, and that, what I don't think you're ever going to get. Right. Um, yeah. And I don't, it would be useless too. I mean, so let, let's say, you know, you reduce meteorology to particle physics or something like that. Like would that help you predict the weather right. or, you know, like, so I guess I, or you reduced art history to part, particle physics, you know, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. first, 
you're not going to get there, not as a human being, even if it were in some sense possible, but it's not. Right? Um, and, you know, so. Like, I guess, do, do, you know, do you think that I'm making a mistake? I mean, I guess I want to say that I think it's stronger than that. That even God couldn't do it. I mean, in a sense that, 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 that whole idea represents a certain kind of basic mistake about, on the one hand, the reality of fundamental heter- heterogeneity, let's just call it. Yeah. And then on the other hand, the relative un- unity or disunity of accounts that we give about something that's fundamentally heterogeneous. Um, do you think I'm sort of making a mistake in the sense that I'm, I don't know, overreacting or or overreacting to what like the to this idea that 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 that, that people so badly want a sort of explanatory unity that thereby drives them to a kind of of of, of to reject fundamental heterogeneity in the world right to sort of to sort of say well you know ultimately physics is general right and so everything ultimately is going to come down to that and if you just had enough time and enough sophistication there would just be one quantum mechanical science and that would be it and everything else would be done. What I want to say is that not just that that's not effective, even no. if you could do it, but that it's, it represents a fundamental misunderstanding of the relationship between world and account, right? Yeah. Um, and definitely if you're doing it in the kind of type identity style, uh, I mean, as Fodor discusses the difference between type identity and token identity. Yeah in these maybe bridge laws and so on. So, you know, the idea that beauty, the, co- the quality of beauty, let's say, is identical to some general property of particles that could be, uh, you know, put out there in a non-ad hoc way, or the idea that anger, right, is identical to uh, a particular type of physical state. Yeah. Like that seems completely implausible to me. Yeah, but I, I am, I am, I am a fan of the token identity thesis, which I, I take it that you're, you, you think your view is compatible with that, right? Like in other words, yeah. But you know, it's it's struggled. I struggled with this, and I didn't want to turn that essay into a philosophy of mind essay, which is what it sort of kind of half turned into. Well, um, but I, I don't know about even the token identity thesis, and that's because of the the problem of 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 uh intentional like of what I'll call externalism and content right i mean so that's why i sort of brought up the 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 putnam twin earth examples as well as the the wittgenstein private language arguments because both of what these do is they kind of render it impossible for one to think of intentional states as entirely internal mental entities or mental processes, right? Because, yeah, because, you know, if, for example, you know, um, um, the content of a particular thought is dependent upon its relations to actual things in the world, then it can't be the case that it's not going to be the case that for any two people, if they're in an identical brain state, they're necessarily going to be having, having an identical thought. Um, And, the rule following arguments and private language arguments make this even worse because if it's the case that the content of any thought um, to entertain the content of any thought involves in part the following of certain rules, right? Um, Which can only be defined, right? And made sense of in a social environment, right? Okay. You have an even more, a bigger problem with the idea that somehow the thought is identical with the brain state, even in the token sense of it, right? Right. Um, um, and so I guess I'm, I'm against both token and type identity, but the reason why I think it, you know that's okay, nobody should get upset, is because the reason why people get upset about being against token identity is that they think it means that you're committed to spooky entities. Yes. And that's why I spent all this time on not this point about non-hypostatic ontological commitment that probably is why I'm a token identity theorist, if I am. But maybe we should explain some of the basic terms here a little bit. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, all right. So this, the doctrine of reductionism, 
at its broadest sweep would be that uh, every, maybe like something like every true claim in any arena about anything could be re construed as a claim about fundamental particles or in terms of physics. Like there is one fundamental reality yep. that potentially explains all the other aspects of reality. Um, you know, and I think that comes from the history of the enlightenment and materialism and a kind of early version of science in which they thought they had discovered the fundamental level of reality and it was the physical material reality. And they started to have incredible success predicting a variety of events and so on with that basic conceptual structure. Well, that, uh, that basic conceptual structure gave you the industrial revolution. It transformed the whole fucking planet, right? I mean, there was no better evidence of its efficacy, right? Than the fact that you could literally create an industrial world out of it, right? I mean, it's, it's right. remarkable. And it was, um, so it, it seemed in a way almost undeniable. Like, look yeah. at these practical effects of, of taking the universe to be this kind of system, like a physical mechanical system. That's right. That's right. And then, so everything else was an epiphenomenon of that or a, we're supervened on it or whatever it may be. All of which I think actually are not really saying anything when you say those things, those to me all, I talk about supervenience in there. Yeah. Um, and, and to me, if you're going to reject the reductionism, then if you're going to reject my, re my way of doing it, and then saying, okay, well, we're just going to allow for, ontological heterogeneity and plurality and explanatory disunity, meaning, you know, sure, in some sense, the subject matter of physics is fundamental, right? Um, um, in We're that all discrete objects and substrates are ultimately made out of subatomic particles, right? But not everything is a discrete object or substrate. I mean, that's sort of the, the very simple answer, right? Um, a parking regulation is not a, is not a discrete object or a substrate, um, um, uh, you know, and, and it's so the right. question now then becomes, well, but if we don't, if we're not reductionist, then aren't we left to thinking that these are sort of funny, weird entities. Right. And that's why I spent all this time early on, on what we mean when we ontologically commit to things, because I don't think that when somebody says there's a parking regulation, which is why I have to fork over 50 bucks, that. The, when they say that, they're talk. They think that they're talking about some weird, funny entity in a Cartesian space, right? Right. But they're not talking about an entity of physics, though. No, and they're certainly not talking about an entity of physics. They're not really talking about a discrete object at all. That's why I said I, I went to all this effort to sort of point out that I, there's no reason to think that ontological commitment entails thinginess, as I called it. Right. 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 Um, um, right. And just just to do the type token thing real quick. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know how, how deep to go on this kind of stuff or like what people need to know or whatever, but, um, the type token distinction is pretty interesting distinction. So for example, you could think of, uh, this is the way I learned it, I guess, in aesthetics, you could think of a literary work like sh like paradise lost by Milton as a type All right, Like it has no particular, it seems to have no particular physical location. Like it's burning a copy of Paradise Lost. Two <laughs> tokens, one type. Yes. Right. Two tokens of the same type. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. So two copies. So, of so, so, right. If I was to say that, um, the, that cups are, that these cups are made of plastic in the token sense, I'd be correct, right? This, this individual and this individual are both made of plastic. But if I were to say that, what it is to be a cup is to be made of plastic. That would be false because, right? Right. <laughs> so being a cup is multiply realizable, right? I mean, it's realizable in multiple substrates, which is why any individual cup is going to be identical with a physical substrate, but right. Um, right. the so property of being a cup is not identical with any physical substrate. Right. right. So, right. Each token cup, is identical with some physical situation. Right, right. Of, right. And I think that that's true of all discrete objects and substrates. And so if you were to ask me, okay, 
To what different. extent are you a token physicalist? I'd say I'm a token physicalist about discrete objects and substrates. They're all ultimately made of matter. But what I'm then going to say is not everything that exists is a discrete sub uh, uh, is a discrete object or substrate. Right. Again, an individual okay. parking regulation like the one that cost me fifty bucks when I violated it last week is not is not made of particles either as a type or as a token. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I want to say. Yeah. So it, yeah, in the, in the in the mental realm. So for example, each time I get irritated. That's a token of the state of irritation. Of being irritated, right. right. And, and the type is irritation or right. ir- being irritated. And the, a type identity theory in psychology would say that there is some physical state of the brain right. that is type identical with being irritated. In other words, yeah. every time someone is irritated, some you know right. identical or similar event happens in the brain. Right. Um, now, a token identity theorist would say not necessarily. They're, right. They're, Only in the individual instance in this case may be identical with their brain state, right. but you know, a silicone may Martian who was irritated might be in a different brain state, and that's what was so appealing about functionalism was because it would say, "Fine, token identity physicalism is true, but type identically physicalism is false." For the theory of types, we're going to have to be a functionalist. And then the computer metaphor is very appealing or the machine metaphor because machines are that way, right? I mean, you can say any individual machine is identical with a specific set of discrete objects and substrates, but what it is to be a machine is multiply realizable. You can make a machine out of wood. You can make one out of plastic. You can make one out of metal. And it can perform exactly the same thing. And so, but the reason why I just sort of, you know, want to sort of say all that's sort of beside the point is because whatever you view you wind up taking on that, that's not where I think the real problem is. I think the real problem is, is, is in this, what I've been calling social reality, right? Right. These things, these, these forms of life, these systems, these institutions, these things that are the result of, I guess, individual and collective intentionality to a certain degree. Right. Um, and, um, um, yeah. Although, you know, I don't know how far I want to press on this, uh, and I don't know how far I could pay this off, not much. But, like, say you take the externalist view. So then a mental state, like irritation, let's say, uh, is not identical to a ne- – or not necessarily identical to a brain state. It's identical – it's a state of the organism in relation to an environment, Right. Uh, in relation to a, in relation to an environment, but also in a relation to practices and yeah. others' representations. In other words, you know what I want to say, sort of, is that um, the reason why. So, so, look, brain states are inside your head, right? They're literally chemical interactions that are going on inside your brain. Yeah. But I don't think mental states are brain states. If by mental states what you mean are thoughts, right? Yeah, I agree with that. Right? Then what I'm going to say is that actually those are social entities, right? Why? Because they have a public dimension, right? That is, they're only realizable in relation to things and to other people. Right. I agree Um, with that. um, And so that's, that's the whole Putnam... Um, uh, uh, mental states aren't in the head, right? Right, um, but, um, but of course, as, as far meaning as like, is not in the head. I mean, I'm sorry, right, meaning right. is not in the head. Yeah, right. As far as the Putnam Twin Earth cases go, though, it, it, that's it, a relation to a thing, right? Because the state is something like believing water is wet or something, right? Right, or believing that yeah. that is water, right? And then part of the content of that, believing that that cup, there's water in that cup, right there. Um, is part of the content of that is that there's H2O in this cup. Right. Whether I know that or not. That's right. Having the thought, my thought entails. That right. 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 Uh, but even so, so that's the Putnam point, And that in a sense, in a sense points that look, you know, to the extent to which, um, a, a thought or a concept, an entertained concept has a referent, the referent, the actual thing, is part of what gives that thought its content. It's not 
entirely things that are inside the head of the person. Completely. But, but there's a further point of it, and that's the part that comes from Wittgenstein, right? Right. Part of what it is to have the concept of whatever it was, wet or cup or whatever, um, is to know how to use it correctly, right? And that can only be a function of publicly articulated rules. And he has an intricate argument as to why you cannot conceive of rules entirely privately, right? And so the extent to which, yeah, right, you know, are all the concepts we engage, part of what it is to have them is to follow certain rules correctly. Yeah. Um, kind of- that, that involves a social dimension. So it's not just that a reference to things, but it's participation in social pra- rule following practices. So, so all that, that means that meaning is not in the head, but is sort of sort of spread around. I completely agree with that. Yeah. And, and that's kind of the social externalism. I mean, I th- I don't know if this has really been worked out carefully in those terms because that's really a. It's rich usually way. separate. People are either externalists, sort of in the Putnamian sense, yeah, or they're kind of all hot and bothered about the rule following problems. But I've not seen anybody give a comprehensive sort of okay. There really is no way to sort of say that thoughts as we mean them when we talk about believing, wanting, hoping, thinking, blah, 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 are literally entities inside people's skulls, right? Definitely. But that's what every single theory of the materialist theory of the mind says. Right. Okay. But at least, okay. As, <laughs> and I, it's just not just false. It couldn't be true, right? Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. If externalism is true, the brain, the mind body problem looks completely different, right? The, the brain cannot be the mind. Yeah. If externalism is true, because the mind extends beyond, well beyond the brain. It has as content. Yep. External world fact. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, as far as that's concerned though, that's compatible with some kind of physicalism. The, if we just go to the Putnam. Um, yes. So, yes. 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 So, yeah. It's just that it's not. It's not compatible with the mind brain, mind yeah. brain physicalism, but it's compatible with physicalism loosely as a overall metaphysics, right? right. It's, then, it's, it's the social dimension that fucks that up as far as I'm yeah. concerned. That's right. And, and the a, most- a space gets created by collective intentionality that I don't, that is real and I don't see how it is reducible or properly treated by appeals to supervenience. I mean, it's really as simple as that in my Wait, view. Yeah. What, what you say means depends on social facts massively, right? Like it's not just a matter of me intending to mean something or, you know, intending to mean the sky is blue when I say the sky is pink or something. Yeah. Uh, it's what I mean is a public matter that's fixed in part by its relations to yeah, uh, yeah. public structure of grammatical rules and so on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, yeah. I mean, I kind of like want to say, like, I think that that can all be kind of uh, physicalized in some sense, but on the other hand, I don't see the real point in that. And I'm starting to worry about why I was ever worried about that. In a way. Well, I, I, I always, you know, I, one level I thought my view was somewhat consistent with the view that you present in entanglements because my view does put us very much into the world, right? And maybe it puts it more even than you do in the sense that it puts the mind outside, right? In I want to do that. I want to do that too, though. Um, um, but I think that maybe the sticking point is my sort of insistence on heterogeneous plural type heterogeneous plural ontologies. Now, I don't know. Maybe you just think we should be quietists about ontology. No, uh, but I, I'm, I'm rethinking in light of your approach, actually. Uh, I guess I'm a little up, up, in the air at this point about what to think about this, but I'm becoming when, more, uh, when you thought of the integration. So in entanglements where you break down these boundaries between internal, external mind world, all this sort of stuff. Yeah. And you, you have these metaphors of integration, things like knots and things like that, which I'm assuming include what I would call wildly heterogeneous elements. Mm-hmm. 
Yes. How did you conceive, did you conceive of their integration metaphorically or did you conceive of it in some literal sense? And if it's literal, what does that even mean? Right. I guess, uh, how did you, did you think that you were giving a metaphor with the threads and the knots and the... All right, so if I said something like, um, okay, so let's say beauty... Like, what's an institution on your view, right? An institution is going to have some physical elements, right? It might have buildings and it might have, you know, the institution that is Citibank includes banks, right? But it also includes a whole set of policies, right? And it includes people. And it includes, um, you know, uh, 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 how shall I say, um, um, uh, public image, right? All these things. I'm assuming you're going to say those are knots. Those are pretty thick knots, right, in the fabric. And then, you, and then, is that a metaphor? Or do you actually think all of these things I just mentioned, these disparate elements, are actually discrete entities and the universe is some bizarre <laughs> substrate right uh no i mean uh i guess my because on my way of reading would be a metaphor right not a metaphor there's not actually a thing that is the institution right institutions don't don't have thinginess uh, i think i think well i think an institution is i mean especially if we're leaning on ordinary language in any way an institution is a thing like in the sense that I mean, it's a value of our, our bound variables. And stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'm using thinginess to denote that narrower notion of a thing as a discrete object or substrate, right? It's so not a I'm, thing in that sense, but a knot is a thing in that sense. Uh, well, not as a vague thing, a very vague thing, right? Like, where, you know, where does it begin and where does it end? Mm. Where does the string going into it? become part of the knot and where is it not quite part of the knot? I hadn't thought of it that I, I only, I, I isolated the knot. I hadn't thought of the sort yeah. of the, it's right. It's all the properties of the knot are relational. I want to say like, uh, mm. so I guess I'm trying to conceive something like Citibank as a massive set of physical facts. And some of them are, you know, brain states of people around Citibank. Some of them are bricks some of them are, uh, you know, software aspects or something like this. But, like, I guess I just was maybe leaning on a faith, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out why I... You wouldn't say, would you, let's be st- speak very strictly, you wouldn't say that an institution like Citibank, that all of the elements that comprise it are discrete objects or substrates, would you? I would say that all, I mean, I guess in my, uh, in my entanglement ontology, I would say that they're all the aspects of Citibank are physical things or physical dimensions or properties in some broad sense, you know? So like it's, so you I, do not, do you not, I mean, maybe this is really getting to the nub of it. And then the question is, you know, both why, and all, yeah. why do you feel the need? It sounds to me like you think we really do have to hypostatize ontological commitments. Well, in other words, what's wrong with the idea that no, there are elements that are neither discrete objects nor substrates. I can tell you what they are. Now, if you ask me, what are they in that? What are they? Then I'm going to say, well, you're asking for something I can't answer because you're presuming that everything is a substrate or a, discrete entity to which that's sort of an answer the way i can answer your question what are they by itemizing them right that was the thing about people remember people are uncles and brothers and fans and now you say well what are they the answer is that's a bad question right yeah and and if i ask you what is citibank right i'm going to answer you could say right i'm going to answer with a whole bunch of elements but i'm not they're not like they're not like pieces of a of a complex pizza, right? I mean, they're, they're, and it's not like metaphysically I need Citibank to turn out to be a coherent single object or something like that. Like, I, I mean, I guess that could be an open question. Like you might like do a bunch of empirical research on Citibank and figure out, you know what? There's actually three separate institutions that overlap slightly or something that, uh, or, you know what I mean? Like, it's not that I want, I need Citibank to turn out to be a real object. 
But if it is a real object, then I need, I, I want to think about it in terms of like a massive conco- concatenation of physical circumstances. But let's say we could even say that every actual element that makes up Citibank is a discrete object or substrate. Let's say we could even say that. I don't think we can. You couldn't, you couldn't give the full account of what Citibank was without describing the relations between those those uh, substrates and um, and uh, uh, discrete objects. And how would you physicalize the relations? They're not all causal, certainly. Some of them are going to be interpretive. Some of them are going to be invaluative. Some of them are going to be representational. Yeah. I don't even know how you how do you describe the representation relation? Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I think even in terms of this, you know, if you really want to be hard nosed about this, you're still going to have a problem with properties and relations, right? Um, no, and I, I don't know that I, I feel it ready to to <laughs> work on this in a problem. Yeah, I'm not expecting you to answer this. I mean, yeah. this is the sort of stuff that is the problem, right? I mean, that, that the people who do metaphysics have been trying to figure out for a thousand years. I guess I'm just sort of. I guess not in your case, but I just do find the expectation a little surprising, right? I mean, I, I, I it is yeah. a very wild departure from ordinary ways of thinking, right? I mean, and, and maybe we want to talk about that because the second paper, the second installment, I talk a lot about what I take to be the role of common ordinary language and uh, what I'm calling common sense, but I don't mean it like in the sense of horse sense. Yeah, but in the sense of sort of you know our sophisticated but but un um untechnical sort of uh, ways of speaking, thinking, experience, etc. I do think that there is a burden on the person who wants to sort of say that you know, no, Citibank isn't what you thought it was. It's this really bizarre entity, right? Um, um, a, if it's if that's not going to help me in any way, I don't know why I would want to go that way. And secondly, if it raises all sorts of problems, I can see why I wouldn't want to go that way. And I'm not so, so sure what it's supposed to be solving anyway, right? I mean, Citibank's right. a bank. It trades on the stock exchange. It's a better or worse actor, depending on what what it, what your part of its functions you're looking at. It's got a lot of employees. I mean, I can tell you all sorts of things about it. Why would the question? of its substrate come up, right? I mean, why would the, you know what I'm saying? It's a very strange. What sort of thing is it? Why would that question come up or? Well, what sort of thing where what you mean is what kind of substrate is it? It's a very strange question to ask of something like an institution, like a bank, right? Okay. Yeah. No one think. no one would, no one, that's not, a, that's not a problem anyone is wondering about except for us, right? I mean. Well, I mean, economists might wonder in various ways, what is a bank? Right, but look at the answers, right? Right. The, the, yes. Think about the law, right? The, it, they're like persons. Yeah, or regulators might. You, have they to. can be sued like people, right? I mean, they can, they, they you know, right. but that to me, that supports my view of it, right? Yeah, okay. Well, does it? I mean, I don't know. Uh, it's pretty weird. It's a pretty weird metaphysics, seemingly. Going Only on. if you, you think of things only in terms of discrete objects and substrates. If you include institutions, families, games. But as, if, you, if you think institutions are like persons or are persons. In some ways and in some ways not, right? Sure. Um, um, it, they, they're like persons in that they can be actors, right? Um, they can be actors in the marketplace, Right. Citibank yeah. can buy stock just like I can buy stock, right? Um, you can, you can um, sue someone or be sued by someone. Right. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know that that's not illuminating. If anything, I think that is illuminating. What's not illuminating is saying it's some bizarre kind of multi-part substrate. I mean, that really is not illuminating, right? Well, I mean, it's a way, like, there are various common things you might, common sense seemingly common sense things you might say if I asked you what Citibank was, like it's a bunch of buildings and it's a bunch of people and it's a bunch of policies and it's a bunch of computers. Right. Like but um, only some of those things are substrates or objects, just read objects, right? Right. But it does. The policies it, aren't. It indicates that, uh, you know, Citibank is happening in the material world in some sense and has many material effects and encompasses many material objects and stuff like that. Like it's not, you know, I can see like it's 
it would it would it would be a violation of common sense to think of it as a spiritual object or a non physical object or something like that. But I feel like that's what almost like the physicalists think we have to say. Yes, if we if we're not on board with the physicalism, and what I'm saying is, I don't see why it makes us say that at all, right? You're convincing me, maybe that. It doesn't force us to do that. Um, and look, think about let's it's actually the thing about companies and per- persons is not a bad one, right? So, so think about just that aspect of for it for a minute. Um, ask yourself if 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 we were to sort of think about the intellectual and discursive landscape in which that issue arises, right? The person, the personhood of corporations, the, dem- the okay. If you had, what is what is at issue there? What's what matters with respect to that? It's all having to do with ethical and legal questions, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Should we treat corporations as persons? It's not. How can we treat long. corporations as persons because they don't have brains, right? Nobody's. That's not the problem, right? Yeah. Why? Because that's not the kind of thing we're talking about, man. I mean, that's not. Right? We're talking about a, a legal entity. We're talking about, a, you know, this is where Locke's conception of personhood really helps, right? Part of the reason why it makes sense to a certain degree to talk about corporations as persons is, is because of a Lockean conception of persons, right? What a person is is a certain kind of actor within certain normative frameworks, right? That's what a person is. Now, is that identity? I mean, now, some persons are human organisms, right? <laughs> But we may, for certain reasons, want to consider certain institutions as persons for certain purposes, right? Now, why does that have to be disentangled more than that, ontologically? Yeah, I, you know, that, I, that, I think that's pretty good. I really do. Uh, I mean, I think that's... No, I'm asking you, honestly, do you have any sense of what the, where the impetus comes from to interrogate that ontologically? I would understand why you'd interrogate it morally, right? But why would you interrogate it ontologically? Well, uh, what's the motivation? Well, I think I think it is it, it's it is a historically emergent uh, emphasis, like idealism or something like this. You know what I mean? Like, in other words, it it, it represents the kind of world that, or it, it may be these fundamental ontologies represent this kind of world that you're yearning toward, or that you feel is compelling, like you have a cultural background, like maybe in some sense, my parents taught me atheism, and I taught and I took them to be talking about uh, the universe as a material system. And there's this whole enlightenment heritage of that, like, I'm not sure. I mean, the motivations for making moves like this, they are, they seem very mysterious, especially just on a philosophical level. But historic, the they emerge historically for comprehensible reasons, right? Like you, what kind of, what kind of universe is open to scientific? I think they emerge from the original scientific revolution. Yeah. And from a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation of the sense in which physics is general. Right. Just to reject dualism or reject spiritual entities almost caught you in this idea that the only things that exist are material things. Right. You know, and then, and hence physics, which describes is the fundamental science of material things, yeah. is the fundamental explanation of everything or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but so I also I, think I also think that there is a certain um misguided application of the principle of parsimony in the sense that um Yeah. And and this this is where the Quinean thing comes in, right? So Quine's famous for his, you know, you know, um I prefer my ontologies to be like desert landscapes, right? With the idea being, oh, if we have profligate ontologies, then we're going to have, he even says this, a crowded, unlovely universe. Now, it's only crowded. <laughs> crowded is a spatial metaphor, right? It only is crowded if the ontology, if what ontology is, is commitment to discrete objects and substrates. You can't get crowded with regulations other than more metaphorically, right? Right, you can you can be crowded by regulations, but not like crowded like all the garbage in my room crowds me, right? Um, um, and so I I wonder whether um, right because kind of a mis misinterpretation of what yeah. is meant by things like principles of parsimony, simplicity, 
I, yeah, I think people are worried, like maybe Klein is worried. Like once you start admitting things and, and varieties of things and dimensions of things, where are you going to stop? Like, aren't you, you know, aren't you like reopening the door to all kinds of supernatural entities? Aren't you, uh, you know, compromising a basic scientific worldview, uh, et cetera. And, you know, but I, I'm not, I, I feel that as a pull, but it can't be dispositive. Right. It's no, like, well, but, but because, I think it's fair. It's fair though. Right. I mean, look, let's take Quine, right? So, Quine famously wanted wanted to get wanted nothing to do with modality, right? He wanted nothing to do with necessity and possibility. Um, and actually, and on what there is, he's like, you know, um, you know, wants to know how many possible fat men there are in the doorway, right? Yeah. Um, um, and is it, are they the same possible fat man, or are they different? And is the possible fat man in the doorway different from the possible thin man in the doorway, so on and so forth? Now, um, now you might say, now it's easy for me to say, well, you know. That's a silly worry because possible men are not are not enti- are not discrete objects such that you're going to have a crowded doorway, right? But yeah. the problem is that then someone like David Lewis comes along and says, "Yes, they are," right? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, and so and so, I almost wonder whether one group of crazy people made other another group of people act crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, how much damage did David Lewis do in the sense of? alarming people about inflationary universes because for you know he, in order to solve some technical problem in logic he's telling us that there is actually a possible fat guy in the doorway like you could like go and find him right i mean you, you think lewis was klein's student at the moment that klein rejected modality <laughs> i wonder about that you know what i'm saying i think he was yeah klein. i don't know i mean i i i I wonder what sort of com- I'm sh- I'm assuming they had many conversations. Oh man. And I cannot imagine how they could have gone, right? I mean, I mean um um look, I think look, I think Quine is almost entirely right with one problem, right? And that is Look, he was right about scientific language, right? It has to be extensional, right? You cannot have intentionality in scientific language because of the substitution of identicals, right? It can't be the case that how something is represented makes some difference in a physical, in a physics calculus. It can't, right? So the language of science has to be extensional. That's absolutely right. What he was wrong was about that somehow you could purge intentionality altogether from language or that keeping it elsewhere. Right commits you to something to crowded doorways full of possible fat men. Right. Um, 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 that's the mistake, but he's right about, about the, the first half of it. And I almost wonder where the second half of it is a combination of the mistaken hypothesization of ontological commitment, which I would think Quine would have known is not the case. shouldn't be done. But yeah. also people like Lewis and others who kept coming with these inflationary kind of metaphysics that is properly alarming, right? It's just bad. It's bad, in, bad thinking, right? I mean, it, 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 to hypothesize possible fat men like that. It's, it's fun, though, and it's provocative. I mean, I, I kind of appreciate Lewis. For well, listen, doing- I'm not going to sit here and say criticize David Lewis in a deep sense. It would be ridiculous, yeah. given that I am nobody. Um, well, but just, yeah. but just, <laughs> I just wonder whether it's stuff like that that people are reacting to, perhaps overreacting. You know, Lewis, who knows how he actually really meant this? You know, what you write and say in these published things, sure. usually you find out in conversation are simplifications. Sometimes they're provocations. I've found that people's views are usually much more reasonable than what they seem to be in print, but you will have to talk to them. Yeah. Me, for example, you're, you in conversation with me, I've become more reasonable. I think, (laughs) you know, the day in which someone is less reasonable than me is going to be hard to imagine. Um, (laughs) No, you're very reasonable. And I think what you're doing in your prolegomena is, are, are, you know, is very reasonable too. Um, Yeah. (laughs) This just bothers me. I, I, I don't know. But I I also, philosophers are wasting a lot of time on this shit. Well, okay, so but when Klein originally like came up with this desert ontology and stuff, um, he's he's reacting not to Lewis, but to no, 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 the German idealism. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, he's yeah, or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? 
like he's saying like okay if we don't have some kind of like you know pretty rigorous restrictive uh standards about these kind of things yeah lord knows what we might say yeah he's reacting these kind of minongian sort of you know in order for a statement like uh, there is no man in the doorway to be true we have to ontologically commit to a non-existent man yeah. but all that i'm saying is that all you have to do is move two inches to the right um to Quine's worries about modality, right? Necessity and possibility. And you can generate exactly the same desert landscape projection to sort of Lewis's. And that's, and he does, even though it's the thing is pre Lewis about the possible fat man in the doorway. I mean, that's an actual example from on what there is. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, I think that they're all worries of a piece. Um, um, Right, and modality is pretty good for your kind of position, right? Uh, like possible worlds or whatever. Yeah. It, 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 we can talk in terms of possible worlds. We could use possible yeah. worlds in our discourse to clarify whatever concepts or, you know, even the, uh, the operators of modal logic and so on. But that doesn't commit us to a thing. Right. In the sense of a discrete entity or substrate, yeah. right? Yeah. It does commit us to something, right? It, in um, fact, um, it specifically commits us not to do that. In other words, like it's a possible world. It's not an actual world. Right? It's, it's not an actual world that's somewhere else. Right. right? Exactly. Um, um, and I know that there's some people who want to be sort of clever dicks and say, you know, you get this kind of stuff. This is where, you know, a little learning just does a lot of harm, right? I mean, the, you get people who's like, who are going to try and like say, oh, well, we can glue that, glue Lewis together with certain interpretations of quantum mechanics. And now the possible fat man really is an actual other guy somewhere else. And I just sort of, you know, you do realize that's just all fucking mathematics, right? <laughs> There's no fucking guy standing anywhere else, for God's sake, right? Right. I mean, but the, it's fucking the, mathematics. But the multiverse hypothesis as people like Brian Greene put it forward, the physicist at Columbia, it sure sounds like David Lewis, right? He's, he seems to be saying that every possible world is actual. I mean... I just think philosophers should be banned from doing that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just... it's Physicists too, man. All, all, all of, well, look, the physicists who do it, and a lot of them don't. I mean, listen... I, you and I both teach. I teach at a university. There's an entire physics department. You know, there are guys doing solid state physics and stuff like that. You know, you ask them, is there an actual guy somewhere else? Right. He's going to say, no, of course not. Right. Um, um, it's only the theoretical ones who sort of fancy themselves as novice philosophers. And then the philosophers who don't really have enough brain cells to rub together to really understand the fucking physics. Right. Because it requires an understanding of the mathematics at a level that you just don't fucking have. Right. I don't. Um, um, and so what winds up, you wind up just having one bad interpretation of it after another. And in the meantime, we're in the middle of one of the worst values crises that we've ever had. Right. With this Corona pandemic. Or like a clash of values, trying to figure out what values are in play. And there's no, philosophers aren't saying a goddamn thing about any of it. Right. I, I just, I just feel like there's a part of the reason why I'm doing this is I just sort of want to take a stand and say all of this is fucking bullshit, clutter, crap. Right. That's a kind of game you playing. Some of it may have been well motivated. Some of it may have come from a real place. But can we just stop now for a minute? What is this supposed to be about? Why am I having arguments with very smart people online about whether muons are conscious? <laughs> what? You know what I mean? Like it's just, it's just. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being. Maybe I'm just cranky, or I don't know what it is. But well, like we got real problems. Not you know. These are and these aren't them, right? I mean, I mean conscious isn't one of them. Um, mm. And I don't, I'm not saying philosophers need to always be engaged with practical affairs, but we already had one shame in the last century when we left it to journalists and essayists and novelists to have the public conversation about fascism and totalitarianism. Right. Hmm. So the philosophers either were complicit, Heidegger, Sartre, all these fucking shits over on the continent, right? who were either fascists or Maoists or some other horrible thing that you would think somebody in philosophy, for God's sake, 
would be the last person, right? <laughs> I, I, I've just been like soaking in. Uh, I'm just reading uh, Tony Jutt's book called uh, Past Imperfect. Yeah. It's, oh, yeah, that's really good. I've read that. It's really good. Yeah. It's about about uh, Stalinism in, among, you know, Sartre. Yeah, Sartre Mar- and Beauvoir. I mean, I can't even, like, these people make me sick just thinking about them, right? I mean, you're talking about ideologies that kill 20 million people, 25 million people, immersed all, half the planet in misery, right? Their justifications are... And you're sitting in a cafe, like, playing with it, right? Like, fuck you, right? I mean... And also, it's completely incompatible with the philosophy that you just articulated 10 years right, ago. Right, right, right. How could you put together existentialism with Maoism, for God's sake? Right? I know. I'm right? working on a book on that right now. Right, so on the continent, you have this outright complicity of philosophers with this catastrophe. And then in the Anglosphere, it was, it's like it's not happening, right? Well, you've, had, you've got basically people like Rawls and his precursors having an internal conversation about the, the tiny details of liberal democracy as if that's somehow assured that we're going to have one, right? Yeah, no need a, for a defense of it at all. At a level um, of abstraction that's, uh, you know, really useless in, in engaging in these. In these I feel things. like we shamed ourselves already last century. Yeah. Well, one, and one now part- we're just shaming ourselves again, right? I mean, the only values down on the dirt, <coughs> excuse me, ground level values conversation I see going on is, is are these social justice lunatics, I don't see any of us weighing in on the really hard questions of today, like, hey, how long are we going to make young people sacrifice their social, personal, and every other aspect of their lives so that 80-year-olds can go to, go to their offices, right? I'd like to have that conversation. We both have college-age daughters, and really the way their lives are being interrupted uh, is very dis- Deserves a conversation. We're not having it at all. I mean, where are the philosophers on this? I don't see them anywhere. Well, I keep trying to start conversations. Nobody wants to have them. We should set to work. I, I, these are hard questions. Like when I try to think about like how I would balance these values or what I would say philosophically to shed light on that, I feel kind of stuck. But I, it would help to just even write. You know what I mean? Like start to contemplate wh- what values are in play, how they might be weighed against one another in different circumstances and so on. Like I, I agree. Like we, you know, Maybe the pragmatists were somewhat better on this in the 20th century than the analytics or the continentals. Like, I think John Dewey. Uh, yeah, so the pragmatists actually have a star, Dewey, who fully invested himself in yeah, the he, social and ethical problems of his time. He's talking about fascism and communism. And, and know, about liberal democracy, yeah. participatory democracy, exactly. his famous clashes with, uh, with, 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 with Lippmann. And the sort of the technocratic, the technocratic push, um, in that sense, Dewey is the only one I can think of in the 20th century who I would say was not derelict in the fundamental duty of a, of a thinker, right? I'm sure there are others. I mean, th- this is a little bit of an attack on analytic philosophy, I guess. Like in Both. The continental philosophies yeah. are morally debased. Right? The continental philosophies were just flat out morally debased. And I'm not going to accept that quite that hard. Well, you, but- the big players, who are the biggest players? Heidegger, Sartre, right? Foucault, right? They're all terrible people. Awful, awful, right? Come on, Foucault. Ah, uh, I'm a let's, big. Let's 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 lower the age of consent to six. I mean, come on, man. All right. Well, and he had a Maoist streak too, which is completely insane given the rest of his philosophy. And I, I don't know, man, but yeah. Right. Someone, argue, or someone worrying about power <laughs> is a Maoist, right? It's just like, what the fuck? <laughs> but, you know, I, we can do better. Like, I think you and I can do better. Like, we, yeah. I, I would like to do this. I mean, I've, I've been trying to think about it. Uh, I've write it, written about it a little bit, but, like, I would really like to – I mean, that's interesting. Like, how would we – you know, how we tell philosophers that they have a moral obligation to be thinking through these. To address the issues of their day? Yeah. Yeah, I, I wouldn't think you'd have to tell them, right? I mean, listen, this is half the reason. There's half the reason why most of the work I do now is public intellectual work, because I don't see any value. I mean, I look, the stuff that's in the prolegomena, I personally enjoy. Right, me I too. I don't think it matters very much, Crispin. Yeah, 
I know what you mean. Uh, I mean, I guess maybe philosophers have done somewhat better on the woke stuff, just in the sense that there's a lot of people writing about what racism is. And Well, look, to the people who think that that sort of valence is correct, they are engaged with the issues of their day. It's just that I, I, I think that they're just they're wrong, right? I mean, so yeah. they're not derelict in this sense that I'm talking about. They are trying. I just view them as the villains, unfortunately, right? Um, but they are at least thinking that, oh, we should be talking about this, right? Um, yes. um, or at least um, the race and gender stuff, the feminism and, like, the race theory, at least it's engaged in the world. In some it's engaged sense. with the right questions. Now, whether I like the, like the positions they're taking, that's a different story. Yeah. But um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess I just sort of, this sort of stuff, A, I do find it interesting. I do think it's there's a lot of confusions and stuff. I do think that a lot of it is historical, and if we kind of see it, but I also do think that there's a degree of kind of fiddling around while Rome burns to it that I, part of my motivation is to clear away the clutter so we can just stop doing this. Yeah. Um, so I worry that that's why I got into it a little bit, like because I wanted to fiddle while Rome burns or I was trying to get away. You know what I mean? Like I was, I was taking shelter in this place of abstraction where I no longer have to worry about everyday shit all the time. Were you, I, did you go straight to philosophy or did you come to philosophy from somewhere else? I was an English major as an undergrad. I guess. I don't know. Uh, so see, I was a history major. Yeah. And I kept it. So I double majored. So to me, I was always interested in things that were grounded. I, I never really took to philosophy because I liked the flights of abstraction. Um, <clears throat> what I liked about philosophy was the, the, the inherently multidisciplinary quality of it. That's why I like sellers so much. It's about sellers for sellers. It's just like philosophy is all about, in a sense, interrogating and managing intersections, right? Disciplinary yeah. intersections, I like that. Me too. Um, I like strategic thinking. I like sort of, you know, in that sense, I do like generality. You know, I do like abstraction, but not unmoored abstraction. Um, I take some comfort, or I especially used to, I think, in unmoored abstraction, like almost like a zone of safety. That's interesting because I always thought that it started, everything for you ultimately started at the political is what I thought. Is that not the case? Am I misunderstanding you? I thought it was that you, you were political from the beginning, I thought. That's, you know, I never, uh, I was pretty political from. Even beginning. when I read your young work, which is how I first met, knew of you, yeah. was through your work in aesthetics, it had an edge. Yeah. That I thought came from what was fundamentally a political imperative. Um, that might an anarch, be. An anarchist imperative. Yeah, but I, w I was also, yes, that's true. And, and probably it all ends up feeding back toward that or something. But I also was, like, really interested in, like, the most abstract questions. Like, uh, I was trying to figure out what was wrong with the theory of forms or something like that. And that got me excited. And, it, I mean, I, looking back on it, it felt like a safe space. Like, hmm. nothing can really go very wrong here. Because, in the life was ter because there was ter real turmoil. I'm wondering whether my extremely comfortable life, life upbringing, life, et cetera. Um, I didn't feel, I didn't need, have a need for escape, <laughs> but someone who really had hard <clears throat> came up hard, which you said you did kind of, I mean, well, it was not that you were mistreated, but that you were in a lot of trouble a lot of the time. I was. And I mean, a lot of family problems. There's stuff, probably a kind of a relief. Yeah. To dealing with something totally unmoored. And I, I guess I shouldn't insult that, right? I mean, I shouldn't insult the desire to, I guess maybe, maybe I'll look at it the other way is that I just feel like philosophy training really, in my view, does, if it's done right, does produce one of the most sophisticated and able minds that one can produce if it's done properly. And I guess I think that's sort of precious and needs to be deployed at the things that we really need to figure out. And yeah. I just don't think that a lot of where we're putting our best people, you know, we're sending all our best people, at least we, we have been sending all our best people to do this shit. 
Right. And all the least people were sending to go talk about ethics, for God's sake. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. I mean, think about the great stars, right? There are hardly any of them other than Rawls or one. Everyone else is who, who really brilliant. They're all working in the technical areas, right? Right. Like, and there's, there's almost a stigma about, like, practical ethics or whatever, right? Like, that's not quite philosophy. Like, that's sweet that you're doing that. But, you know, if you really could think your way through modal logic, you probably would, wouldn't you? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's really – that's really too bad. I think maybe yeah. it's a little bit because I, I'm not sure the profession can continue at that abstract level and stay – Oh, I think that's already disintegrating now. I mean, I think that's why the current stars – are the social justice people because it's sort of realized now that sorry, Timothy Williamson, but nobody gives a fuck about your modal Lewisian metaphysics. Nobody fucking cares. Right. He's a killer though, man, that Williamson, man. Yeah. But you know what? I, I you know, I'm sure, you know, he'll never see this, but I'm, I'm just going to say it. I, I dislike him intensely. Okay. Because of his attitude. He's, a, he's a, Timothy Williamson, the metaphysician, the Oxford right. metaphysician. It's incredibly arrogant. Um, he wrote some really dismissive thing about public philosophy. Yes, I read um, that. And I just thought to myself, dude, do you not understand that nobody gives a fuck about what you write about? And it doesn't matter, man. It doesn't yeah. matter. It could all disappear off the face of the earth tomorrow and nobody would notice, right? right. Williamson's conception, conception of public philosophy was a public philosopher would be a mouthpiece. For him. <laughs> yeah, We're talking about metaphysics, right? So that, that someone could tell ordinary people what these great philosophers are doing, and right. that's what public philosophy would be. Yeah, no, no, no. And plus, I'm not going to be able to tell the average person what Timothy Williams is doing in modal logic as metaphysics. No. I'm not going to be able to do that. And if I could, they would just fall asleep. You know, right. if I could into ordinary language, right, right, but. Man, I admire that book, man. Like it's that's a really hard, good book in a lot. Of but that's what I mean, like the wasting of a great mind, right? I mean, it's just sort of like, you know. But I think this is the reason why I think that this is now no longer sustainable, right? This has collapsed. Um, there's only a small number of institutions that can afford to hire people just to do this, right? Um, there, you know, these the number of institutions that can do that is just shrinking with Corona and the economic yeah. pressure it's going to put on universities, it's going to kill it entirely. I think that's the reason why all the current rock stars are the social justice warrior people. Yeah. The problem is the discipline historically has shoveled all of the lesser minds and all of the personality disorders into those areas, right? <laughs> Such that you have the current shit show of the McKinnons and the Kuklas and all of these people who to everybody normal just look like crazy, like insane people, the way the things they say and do and, uh, and the, the way they attack people and, and all of that. Right. And meanwhile, we've got very serious things going on. I, and I guess I do think that um, we, what I, what I want to do is I want to sort of say, look, all these technical, highly abstract issues that we're spending so much time on, it's mostly wasted effort because most of these questions and issues are either misunderstood in a very fundamental way, derived from misunderstandings, or from historical developments that were misinterpreted or misunderstood. So let's just settle this now, okay? This is what this is. It's relatively small. It's relatively mundane, right? There are regulations and there are institutions. It's not some super complicated idea everybody knows what it means the metaphysics of it shouldn't spend take more than five minutes to talk about instead of five centuries and let's now spend our energies on these things that really matter like how are we going to balance and negotiate the interests of young people and old people in the middle of a pandemic i would love that our greatest philosophers to be talking about that i haven't heard a single one Right, but now, on the other hand, though, when Timothy Williams talks about that... Does he? I mean, if, if, when he, if he did, <laughs> would, would that be as worthwhile as him on modal logic? Do you see what I, I mean? Know. I don't know. That's the other thing is, I don't know. I mean, to, it may be that these people are all idiot savants, right? 
well, you talk to him about, you know, uh, the local mayor's race, you might find that he's a complete lunatic, right? He's a complete imbecile. I have no idea. Um, um, right, but definitely, you know, these people who are doing ethics, this is an Im- immense ethical, you know, world of dilemmas and stuff like this. And we probably do need people to help us try to figure out how to yeah. think our way through this. Yeah. Yeah, that's why that's why I'm shifted almost entirely to public intellectual work. I just cannot either justify or sustain an interest in working in these technical areas um, exclusively or even primarily. So I'm kind of part of doing these prolegomena ultimately as a, my sort of final statement on this stuff. So are you and it's sort of a call to everyone to like, okay, could we now go over here and do this this other stuff that you know what I mean? I, are you no longer thinking this is a book or is it? Well, I'm going to take the installments and I am going to revise them to where it, there is a single document that, and I'm going to, there's going to be revisions. I'm going to have to change some things. There are things that arise out of our conversations. I'm going to have to change things that are people, I have very good people pressuring me in the comment sections. Yeah, I've seen some of the comments. Some but that's good. because the people who comment there are all either like scientists or, or PhDs in f- f- literature or whatever. They're all smart people. Yeah. Um, one of them is a linguist. Um, so I yeah, am we- going to try and publish it um, as a single book. But it's not going to go beyond prolegomena. I mean, I mean, it's going to stay pretty relatively tight and and small. But it's going to be more than what there is now. I mean, I, there's a lot of promissory notes that have to be cashed out sure. and sure. arguments that I need to actually ex- articulate and not just sort of point at. Because um, I tried to keep each of these pretty short. Yeah. Um. Um. So. And could, um. And you could use this to gesture. To, to, toward what you actually do think is the most important or like in other words like you know this is my attempt to get this kind of shit out of the way so I can do yeah think about these things which are the real things and yeah. then maybe a couple of chapters too you know? and not even just a matter of clearing clutter but one of the things I do hope comes out of this is a reappreciation of the significance and fundamental quality of the social I guess I want to sort of rehabilitate the idea that philosophy comes operates out from out of the manifest image. It's primarily engaged with the space described by the manifest image. And thus it's, 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 it's something in which we should be directly engaging in a substantive way with the fruits and the challenges that arise from collective intentionality. Right. I mean, I mean that, that in a sense, and that the other stuff, you know, what it's all made out of where it all comes from is really not that important. Right. Um, um, and is far less complicated than you actually think it is. Right. Um, um, In a lot of ways, maybe philosophy has moved toward the social as fundamental slowly for a long time. Do you think philosophy has? Uh, well, I'm thinking people like Marx. I'm thinking people like Dewey. Yeah, but didn't that kind of get aborted? Yeah, or Wittgenstein, you know, or uh, maybe even people like Searle who were working on all these, like, social categories. Yeah, I just feel like the positivists kind of, to a certain extent, crib death a lot of these things. And then because of the success of science – and the the bounty of industrialization, people just all kind of got seduced into this very technocratic science science oriented. You know, Susan Sontag talks about that and that piece um, against interpretation, which I really like. Her objection to interpretation in, in 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 art criticism is that it's too it makes criticism too scientific. It makes it investigative in a scientific manner. And she says, we already have too much, right, um, of, a, of a scientification of our understanding of the world and of ourselves. Um, yeah. And um, I guess part of what I want to do is by sort of reestablishing the fundamental and primary of the social is to say, let's explore it in its own space rather than constantly trying to explain how it really derives from this other space, right? You know, we're always trying to get rid of it. 
Yeah, uh, well, we, we are maybe, but, you know, one thing... I, I mean, I, philosophers, we are always trying to get rid of it. And I think also in the popular scientific conscious, we're trying to get rid of it too. Come on, the know, whole psychopharmacological approach to our problems is reductive, right? Yes, it is. It's that there's the mind-brain identity thesis in a very primitive way, actually, usually. Uh, one thing I w- would say yeah. about this is continental philosophy is, has been relentlessly social. Yeah, it's much better in this regard, yes. Yeah, yes. I mean, like Foucault, what, yeah. what, what does Foucault think a concept is or whatever? It's certainly a social yeah. No, they've they've been much better on the on the and that's 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 listen. Europe is where the great tradition of sociology itself comes from, right? It's sure. a European science. Yeah. Um. That then we 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 sort of practice ourselves, but no, I agree with that. I just I don't know what it is, whether it's a darkness in the European soul or what it is that I really truly just don't understand how th- those sorts of lights, those sorts of intellectual lights could embrace such utterly debased. I don't understand that. My yeah, father, you know, Jews have a very funny and unique sort of perspective on Europe. My father yeah. just thinks there is just something dark in the European heart that goes back so far that it probably would be impossible to identify where it really comes from, right? I mean, it just... Yeah. You know, the anti-Semitism is millennia old, right? Yeah. And very pervasive, but it's deeper than that, I think. Um, although I do think that is one of the fundamental, because the founding of, the, of Christendom is, in a sense, founding out of a founding out of anti-Semitism, right? Um, hmm. It's in the, the rejection of the of the Hebraic and, and a lot of the things about that's the true. Hebraic. But that that's just way off the off the rails. Um, we're, we're going way long, Crispin. Um, thank you so much. I just well, love the way these things go because the whole set last half of this was not at all about what we yeah, thought we were talking about at all. I was going to hit you again on the manifest image or whatever. No, that's all right. <laughs> well, so let me just say there's, you know, I'm probably going to, there's going to be one or two more of these and then that's going to be of, of essays of installments. So we probably will just do maybe one more conversation on the last two installments if we yeah. want to do a, a finalizing one, I am though going to try to do a summarize. Uh, I'm, the last thing I write is going to wrap together. Mm-hmm. I tried to do that um, in some of the. I, I sent you some answers. I sent to a comment. Yeah. And the and I tried to sort of do a little wrap up there. Why am I doing all of this? Good. Um, and so. Fine. Still, so. But I don't. You know, my last worry is. At the end of the day, this is supposed to be a letter to philosophers. But I'm I'm just not operating in venues that they're going to be listening in. And that's sort of, I'm not, I, I'm starting to think I maybe do need to ultimately make this something that can be published academically. Yeah. But I'm very, wow. very resistant to it, right? I don't want to. If there was some third way I would take it. I mean, I think the way you're writing is compatible with the academic publication, right? Yeah, I mean, but the conventions of citation today would require an enormous amount of work that, to my mind, is completely unproductive. The I mean, sole purpose it serves is to make it acceptable to this crowd. And that's the thing. I'm, I'm very resistant, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm just like... I don't accept Jumping that, through right? Jumping through hoops, and all you want to do is make your point. You know? I'm building this my own platform precisely so that I don't have to do that. And so if there's, I just wish that there's some would be some way to do it outside that frame and yet still get those people's attention. Yeah. And I'm not sure how to do that. That's something I got to think about. Um, how have you, I mean, God, you've published so much. Has none of what you've published been the sort of thing that, you know what, I do not want to do this academically, but the people I want to talk to are the academics, right? I mean, have you ever not been faced with that? I mean, I guess I didn't really think about it quite like that. I, I guess I think a lot, uh, I, I when I'm writing a book, which I'm doing again for the first time in some years now. Are you um, really? You got a new one going? Yeah. And it's basically uh, similar about like people like Sartre and de Beauvoir and Stalinism 
and why oh. communism has persisted in the intellectual world so long, so hard. Oh, fascinating. That's interesting. I mean, I guess I think about it often when I'm writing, I think about philosophy professors reading this, and, but I'm usually thinking like I'm, I'm going to try to provoke them and piss them off. But I don't know. I don't know how many how many readers I have <laughs> among philosophy professors anyway, though. Um, yeah, I mean, but you publish your academic books, and you publish on SUNY Press and other university presses, right? Then you do your op eds, your stuff yeah. for journalism, Splice, Wall Street Journal. Yeah, yeah. But is there anything where you do? In the manner and vein of that, but the target audience is not the general public, but yeah, hey, I want to talk to you philosophers, but I'm not fucking putting 20,000 footnotes and I am not quoting everybody you care that you think is smart. And I'm just going to tell you, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's frustrating to me that you can't, that there's no way to talk to that audience without engaging in those, what I take to be meaningless rituals at this point. It would it'd be um, good to have forums along those lines where that was possible or just like a, a more open academic publication situation. Or you have to be so huge. Yeah. You have to be like Harry Frankfurt, right? To where you can write a book called on bullshit and the academics will read it, even though it's not got no footnotes. You know what I mean? But that's just not, I'm never going to be that right. That's never going to happen. You're more like that, and I wondered whether you ever succeeded in crossing over in a way that you had both audiences, sort of? Maybe not, though. Maybe some uh, conference papers back in the day, you know, where maybe the, the, the topic of the conference or the session was where is philosophy or what should philosophy be now or things like that. I have might you have published been- any book on trade presses, books? No. I guess not. Uh, I mean, Six Names of Beauty with Routledge was sort of tradey, I guess, but that's, I guess that's an academic publisher, basically. Yeah. I don't know. This, this book I just did with Massimo that's on, uh, and Sky Cleary that's on, um, speaking of someone who loves Bovar, she's going to be furious if she sees this after me cursing <laughs> Bovar. I'm sorry. Um, but um, this book is on, Rut- not Rutledge, this book is on Random House, which is obviously a huge trade press. Yeah. And I am getting the impression has a crossover readership, but the subject matter lends itself to that, right? I mean, it's, it's about philosophies of life, religious traditions and so on and so forth. What I'm doing, this, this, these prolegomena, it's not like that. It's a different, and, and I guess I, I don't see how I could go a similar trade press route and get the academic audience because it's just that the, the, the subject matter is too esoteric. It's too, it's too disciplinary, right, in nature. Um, um, I have to think about this. Yeah. Um, um, maybe use social media, try and crash all of these people's social media environments. But <laughs> but what happens is then they just get angry at you. I don't know that they then go and read the shit you write, right? I mean. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> all right, Chris. But anyway, I love you, man. I hope you feel oh, well. Stay oh. well. And, um We'll, uh, I'm sure we'll do another one of the one more before we go back to school. So, right. I won't wish you a good semester yet. <laughs> yeah. Good. Right, Take care. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.